Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered. Like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. There's a lot of enthusiasm in your, your side. A lot. <laughs> Welcome to the next reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. The Babadook is over. That's the end of the internet. You all right? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. You don't have to be fine, you know. Just a bit stressed at the moment. All children see monsters. Not like this. I want to report someone stalking me and my child. You can't get rid of the Babadook. You can bring me the boy. You can bring me the boy.
The Babadook. This is number four of our horror debuts uh, series. Mm, Jennifer Kent. Mm, Jennifer Kent. Uh, talking about Babadook. And we're still trucking through our horror debuts. And so I guess you could say this movie feels like the spiritual sequel to Goodnight Mommy. Or prequel. One of the two. Very much so. It's another story dealing with grief, dealing with kind of uh, a, a family in crisis, trying to figure out how to get through um, these elements that are happening. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think there will be a lot of conversation about that as we kind of continue talking about Babadu. So I, I have to ask because I forgot last time to ask this, and I would like to get you to weigh in on the central question of our conversation. Did Pete like this movie? And remind me, had you seen this before? Had you seen, because you hadn't seen any of our horror debuts series before, right? I had seen this. You had seen this one. Okay. I had seen this one as well. I think that you think it's okay. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that there are elements that you enjoy as far as the depiction of kind of the the Babadook and that side of the story I think maybe hmm, I think maybe you think it's a little heavy handed with its treatment of the message or the metaphor <laughs> and I, I I'm debating what you think about the kid and, the, and the, just like the relationship between mom and son yeah um I don't know I'm torn on I'm torn on that I don't know. I don't know. Andy, I can't wait to see how this plays out. I'm telling you, this is this is this is a real cliffhanger. <laughs> it's something, that's for sure. <laughs> um The Baba Duke is unrated, but it it does feature moderate violence and gore, a lot of it having to do with a young child, a six year old, and in his relationship with his mother and friends and family and neighbors. Um mild profanity and some severe frightening and intense scenes, including, uh, including, you know, the Babadook running around and not the, uh, not the, not the one spewing rainbows. This is the one that's just spewing black. So well, I'm going to need to hear about the rainbow one, uh, in more detail. Also course overhead lighting. <laughs> so be forewarned. We're talking about all of this on yeah. the show today. I don't know how many of you check, but we do release show notes with all of the movies that we talk about. And in those show notes, we have links to the movie. And if there's an Apple link or an Amazon link, you can click on those. They will take you to their site and you can rent or buy the movie. When you do this, we get a tiny piece of that profit and it helps us out. Especially the Babadook. He actually called and he said, Baba, merch taste. <laughs> <laughs> he's really specific but he wanted you also to know about our merch store we're, we're putting more and more stuff in the merch store if you haven't checked it out truestory.fm slash merch you can get shirts stickers mugs mass pillows not even logo stuff like you can't can get the new uh next year logo you can get the logos for for the shows but you can also get our uh, tie-ins, our movie tie-in merch, which is fun. We're having a great time doing it. Uh, and We're putting more and more up every week. So truestory.fm slash TNR merch. Have you seen The Babadook? We want to know what you thought about this movie or any of the movies that we're going to be talking about moving forward in our current season. Just record your 30-second audio file and send it to reviews at truestory.fm as soon as you watch the film. And it just might pop up on the show. So make sure you're paying attention to the movies that we're going to be talking about through the rest of the season, which you can find over in our profile page on Letterboxd. Profile page on Letterboxd? Andy, that's crazy. We're on Letterboxd too? That's right. We're on Letterboxd. We have a profile page. Uh, we have an HQ page over at uh, Letterboxd.com. We love Letterboxd.com. A fantastic way to keep track of the movies you watch and your feelings about them and the feelings 
uh, from other movie lovers. Uh, they're fun and funny and insightful. It is a fantastic community. And Letterboxd has partnered with us to give a, a, a little a little bite off the, the price to upgrade to a pro or patron account over at Letterboxd. Get rid of the ads, support their development. Uh, great service, great team. If you want to get that discount, visit thenextreel.com slash Letterboxd uh, or just use the code NEXTREEL at checkout and you will get 20% off either of those upgrade plans. This also works for renewals. We are still in our questionnaire phase right now. We're trying to get feedback from all of you as to what you're thinking about, changes we've made, how you're enjoying the show, where you listen. Just trying to get a sense of your habits. Uh, We're going to keep that poll open through the end of this current series. So you've got uh, three more weeks to hop in there and fill it out. We would love to know what you think about this show and the other shows under the True Story FM entertainment banner. Just go to truestory.fm slash the next reel. Right at the top of the page is a big yellow uh, banner with the questionnaire button. Just click on that, fill it out. We really do appreciate it. And remember, one listener who fills out the questionnaire is going to get a free year of membership. Hey, everybody, we need your support. We don't sell your info. We don't partner with any super info invasive uh, tracking services to track your listener behavior like some podcast networks do. We just need your direct support. Um, And so to do that, we invite you to become a member. Members get to vote on our weekly Saturday matinee polls to choose the list topic based on the movie that we're talking about each week. If you were a member, you could have already voted on the list topic for The Babadook already. Members also get early access to every episode in their very own bespoke personal podcast feed once they sign up. And there are so many bonus episodes. It's bananas. It's bananas. Past bonus episodes, current bonus yep. episodes, you get all of the bonus episodes. There are the monthly member bonus episodes where we're filling in gaps from past or current series. There's the monthly flick chart re-ranking episode. And this season, we have the new retake episode where we are walking through the series that we just finished, talking in kind of a macroscopic view of all the points that we gleaned from that particular series. And members also get to vote about what we'll be talking about in our member bonus episodes that fill in holes from past series. It's a fun little perk. Members can watch the live stream as we record the shows and can access the live streams from any of the, our previous shows anytime they want. And members get access to the super secret members only channels in our Discord server. And now members get stickers. That's right. We are going to be mailing stickers to members, uh, you know, here and there. We're just going to send them out and surprise you. It's uh, it's just another fun way to show that we appreciate you supporting us. Best of all, you don't have to listen to this every time. That's right. We cut all of this out in that members episode that you get in your bespoke personal podcast feed. At the truestory.fm slash TNR membership, you can learn all about our membership tiers. The most it'll cost you is $5 per month or $55 per year. Meet Zinnia. You are being very polite to someone who is attempting to kill us. Her wife, Saffron. You can plan all you want, but what matters is what you do when your plan falls apart. And their best friend, Goldie. Glad we didn't miss all the fun. Swords in hand, they defend their city from the worst of humanity. I am Lord Buxton Blue. Vicious Soir. The Fraconian Ring. Care Hag. Equity Electric. Follow their adventures on the Swashbuckling Ladies Debate Society audio drama podcast. Available now at truestory.fm slash swashbuckling. Where do you get this? On the shelf. <laughs> if it's in a word or it's in a look, you can't get rid of the Babadook. If you're a really clever one and you know what it is to see, then you can make friends with a special one, a friend of you and me. (laughs) His name is Mr. Babadook, and this is his book. A rumbling sound, then... 
three sharp knocks. Ba 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 duk duk duk. That's when you'll know he's around. You'll see him if you look. Ba 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 duk duk duk. We might read another one tonight, eh? But you said I could choose. This is what he wears on top. He's funny, don't you think? See him in your room at night. Mum, does it hurt the boy? Mum, does it live under the bed? Mum, mummy, mummy. How sweet they are! So. Telling of the happiness and loveliness that lay at the bottom of the ocean. The ocean. Babadook. The Maybe. Babadook. Duke. Duke. Mm-hmm. Some call it. Mm-hmm. Was this a real? thing the babadook is that like a character i should know before this movie the rainbow spewing one no no the rainbow spewing one comes uh because of this movie and because of the way that it had been adopted by the lgbtq okay. community all right good all right we can talk about that I- you'll find memes and images <laughs> of it where where it's the babadook but then he's like got the big rainbow uh a, it looks like a stream of rainbow vomit coming out of his mouth but oh, uh, the, you know great. there's all sorts of memes and images that are very uh lgbtq positive yeah uh, kind of blew up the character this movie right yeah yeah, yeah but it was so, not this was not like a based on an, an ancient australian yeah. character child book or child no book. not like <laughs> child, book. <laughs> child book correct no not like um you know the the golem or you know yeah. one of these other sorts of creatures that had been around before mm-hmm. uh the babadook I, while my understanding is that it actually does translate in i think hebrew to he is coming for sure or he's definitely coming but i don't know if that was the intention because also you know people have pointed out that the babadook is an ana- or babadook is an anagram of a bad book so i mean there's all these different things that kind of have been pulled from it I, I think that largely Jennifer Kent kind of came up with this creation on her own as her little monster that very much, uh, you know, if you watch her short film Monster, you'll see she was really pulling a lot from, you know, her own imagination because it's very similar to that one. Interesting. Yeah. And and I, I have to say, just leading in, I really enjoyed Monster and I enjoyed Monster in some ways that uh, that were i i found better than the the film the babadook so interesting okay. can i come clean oh ooh, okay i watched this with my son and this is part of our horror exploration i got him to settle in with me and watch it and in that respect uh it was a fascinating experience watching this because you know it's not gory horror it's it it is sinister in just the the look and feel of the movie. It's not a yeah. It, yeah no one dies. N- yeah, no one except dies. For the dog, which was the scariest part of the movie for you know for for him for sure uh, was was that experience and the fact that so much of the deeper lessons of this movie are worn so heavily on its sleeves. Like you have to reach. Well, not very far at all. You don't even have to get up to reach for the meanings of this in this movie. It's so apparent what she is talking about in this film that it made it an enjoyable experience to talk about the film afterward because it was a great way to talk about, you know, the use of metaphor and um, and symbols to to talk about things that you're not literally talking about. Right. Until in this movie, you kind of literally are. And so I I thought that was a fun experience. So in that regard, as a as a teaching tool, this movie is is sort of an ABCs of of horror watching or of of you know movie interpretation. Now, personally, I felt like it was too much. It was really heavy handed. It didn't make me work at all for some of the messaging in the movie. It is a movie about grief and addiction and trauma and the Babadook and her relationship with the Babadook is so literal a transformation that I found it a, a little bit tedious. Now, I, I think as a filmmaking exercise, 
it it is she's a competent filmmaker for sure. I didn't hate this movie, but I was surprised at just how many people love this movie when I did not connect with it as well as I hoped. And I would like to say, per our discussion before our uh, housekeeping, Andy, you nail me every time. <laughs> not quite. I feel like I've been. Uh, maybe 50-50 at best. Well, this so is pretty good. I, I'm listening to you in the beginning, and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, he gets he gets me. Yeah. He had me at hello. Uh, so interestingly, I watched this with my daughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny. At the end of the film, we get to the end of it, and she's like, "I don't get, I don't get it. I like, I, I don't think I, I like horror movies don't end like that. I don't understand what it, what it was doing, and so." Yeah. We had we had a little conversation about it and stuff, and I, I don't think she walked away appreciating it. But what's funny about that is when I first saw this film, I don't think I was really thinking about it at all. I think I just watched it and didn't process it because I'm like, huh, that was an odd film. I don't I don't know what people like about it so much without ever processing the fact that there were any metaphorical elements to it at all. I was just like, that was a strange little movie. I don't know why people love it so much. And so my initial takeaway was very much like my daughter's, like, hmm, I don't get it. And then I, I kept reading people saying, you know, all these people who loved it and stuff, talking about it being metaphorical. And so I started thinking about it. I'm like, huh, okay, I guess I totally missed, or I just wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't putting myself in a place to, to even kind of open myself up to that. I, my, first react, my first viewing was very much just a face value sort of movie, mm -hmm. which you know, I didn't really appreciate very much. Well, like, that really, really surprises me knowing you that, that yeah, you were just, able to get away with watching this movie on face value. Well, that, <laughs> that surprises it, the hell out of me. I know. I know me too. And I just, I, I don't know if it was just because on that first viewing, like mother and son, super annoying pair. I had a really hard time dealing with them. And so, you know, part of me was just like, when is the Babadook going to kill these two? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was probably my initial, um, you know, thoughts about this particular movie. And so, I, you know, watching it again, I mean, as I watched it again, I'm like, wow, I don't know how I didn't see any of this that first time because it's, it is pretty apparent. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't find it a problem that it was so apparent. I think my challenge is still the depiction of the mother and son as being such a uh, such a pair that are so um uh, difficult to connect with through the film because we're walking into this situation 7 years after there had been this uh, horrific accident that decapitated dad in the car and it was on the the day that the son was born so she has this thing about that day but it's taken 7 years to get to this point and I mean, at this point, he hasn't been raised well because of her. She is a mess because of all of this sort of stuff. So, I mean, I get where we are, but it also makes them very difficult characters to, for me, to connect with. And then as I start thinking about it, I'm like, why has this taken them, her specifically, seven years to get to this point? Like, why have no, like, her family has not been pushing her? You need to go to counseling. This, you need to, this is affecting how you're raising your son. Like it, I start going too far down this road. And then I, I start, I have to step back. And this is where I think, you know, there certainly is a connection to Goodnight Mommy here because there's a depiction, there's this element of depicting poor parenting in films, in particular in these cases, horror films, that I think it's worth talking about because part of it we have to acknowledge. It's part of the story. We we can't necessarily judge the script or the filmmakers for including it because they are purposefully putting it there because this is a person who is making bad choices. But I do think that there is a line for the character traits that we can buy and those that we don't. And I think that becomes, for me, a connecting point with this film. Like, where are where is that line? that allows you to connect with somebody who, and I suppose it's the sympathy versus empathy thing. Um, what does it take to connect with this character, even though, you know, you can very quickly come to judge her right at the start of the film? That's an interesting thing that you, that you had that reaction to their relationship, that parent-child relationship. That for me was my favorite part of the film. 
their relationship because I felt like I could feel her parental fatigue with him. I don't necessarily know that I want to weigh in on why it took seven years for it to come to this sort of peak, uh, but I, I do think it's important to note that the movie depicts triggering events in a way that I think is is interesting, and that for her, there is some triggering event that leads to things boiling over the way they did for her in terms of grief, in terms of making these decisions to to sedate her son um, and, and this effort with, you know, this example of adults exuding power over children by them having a conversation together about, you know, the doctor and, and the mother having this conversation about giving drugs to their to their child just so she can sleep um, and, and so that he can sleep, but really so that she can sleep like that level of sort of manipulation, how parents can become addicted to their children's medication. Uh, and, and I don't mean by taking their medication, but to their children when they're on medication. I think it may have been a febrile convulsion. That's when the brain overheats. It always looks worse than it is. I've never seen anything like this. We'll have to wait until the tests come back. All these other results are normal. He's obviously suffering a high level of anxiety. Very committed to the monster theory. That's an understatement. All children see monsters. Not like this. And it's getting worse. He's becoming aggressive. You could see a psychiatrist. I can refer you. It takes a few weeks to get in. That'd be great. But can you just give me something for now? Just to make him sleep and just until just until we get an appointment please I haven't slept in weeks and and neither has Samuel and when we go home tonight this whole nightmare will start up again and I am really I'm really not coping I can give you a short course of sedatives just until the tests come back. Most mothers aren't too keen on them unless it's really bad. It's really bad. Those sort of behaviors, I think, are, are like alluding to the complexity of being a parent. And when she reacts in rage, those extremes the way she does to her child, um, I, I could relate to that. I could relate to those those feelings of frustration, not frustration even necessarily at my child, but frustration at me for not being able to handle this better. And it erupts in ways that are completely unintended. And, you know, I, I feel like now I've been a parent for a long time to two kids who are effectively grown and, and we made it through the hardest times. I'm not going to say I didn't understand where she was coming from in this movie. It was extreme in horror movie extreme compared to my experience but i knew that where the seeds were planted and so i thought for me that that centrally became the thing i was sort of hanging my hat on i really didn't care so much uh, about the babadook story uh insofar as i i really appreciated the parenting story okay well i mean and, and i'm not saying i don't appreciate it i think that it's a really it is a strong depiction of like this, this uh, weariness. She's a very weary parent. And he is clearly a kid who, I mean, it's interesting. I think there is an element of autism perhaps in, uh, in Samuel. Like, but he might be you know, on some sort of spectrum. He's yeah. on some, he's on some spectrum. Some people online have talked about that who come from families with autistic children and say, he very much is depicted in the in that same way that that um, that they have come to experience. I couldn't find anything with with her talking about that in in writing the movie. I haven't seen anything either. I've just I've just read that people some people from autistic homes have yeah. said he feels very much like you know he's displaying some of those traits that they have recognized. Who knows if it was intended or not? But it it, it comes across like. There is something there in the way that he reacts with people, but also it does feel like this is a kid who hasn't been controlled well as and parented well, I should say, as far as how she's handling him. And I think that that's a really interesting story. You know, I, I like the way that the nightmare kind of comes to life. I, you know, I, 
I find myself questioning a lot of it. Like, what are we meant to assume with the appearance of this book? You know, like, you know, is is their entire situation, does that all become metaphorical and is not really happening? Like all of the stuff with the book, is it all in her head? Uh, you know, there's there's so many things that you start questioning, or is it just the movie itself that's the metaphor? I don't really know. But I kind of like that the way that it is depicted, and I, I, and I guess specifically because the way that it ends, where, you know, you have this creature locked up in the basement, that she has found a way to to manage. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, for me, that became the strength of the whole Babadook story, the way yes. that she was kind of managing it at the end. I thought it was really interesting. And so to that end, I, I think there are a lot of elements in here that work. I don't necessarily think it's as strong as a lot of people say, at least for me, but I did, I did find it interesting. But case in point, it's a film where it does make you kind of connect with a parent and a child who aren't necessarily role models that you very easily can connect with. Yeah, I would. Yes, I certainly would say that there's she's not a role model. I think she's more of a vessel for a past experience, right? A vessel uh, uh, that I can I can uh, whether or not I connect, I certainly relate. Are those two different things? Well, the, no, that's that's yeah, that's that whole sympathy, empathy. Thing, yeah, right? yeah. And uh, so to your point about the end, I mean, the fact that this this thing Th this thing in the world, in the, the universe of the film, this thing is a real tangible sort of terrestrial thing that she is able to conquer and it lives in the basement and eats worms and she is able to tame it. And then we're back in that metaphor relationship of whatever it represents, her rage, her guilt, her shame, her, um, you know, her fear, her grief, her addiction, all of those things are manifested in this real beast, the real beast that put the book back together and put the book on her on her stoop. And in, in the universe of the movie, I see that very much as a real thing that she tamed and the metaphor is so heavy handed that in the experience of watching the movie, I find it kind of exhausting. It's the experience of talking about it afterward that I think is more compelling than the movie itself. Well, and I can see that. And I guess it depends on how, um, how much you're just watching the film, knowing that it's basically her grief that she's dealing with, you know, because I think there's an interesting horror element that, that comes through with this really creepy nightmarish creature. Yeah, It is a monster is movie. Yeah, it's incredibly effective. Like the way that they film it, the way that the Babadook appears, like it's it's a terrifying creature. And I am very compelled with the tools that Kent used with her team to kind of like make the way that its movements looked and everything just I mean, it really just feels incredibly creepy. I I, I can't get enough of seeing the Babadook on screen. And uh, um and so I, I don't know, I guess I give it a lot of flack because I just I kind of just am waiting for those moments because it's exciting to see those parts. Yeah, yeah. I this movie I know this is not true. I'm about to say a thing that I think is is objectively not true, but I don't know the answers. It's somebody said online on the internet once uh that um you know after some number of days without food, eventually a dog will turn on its owner and just try to eat you, right? And I went and looked up that and dog trainers from around the world says that's dogs. You got to understand the mind of a dog that rarely, rarely happens when when dogs do that. But that has become an able metaphor for me when to to exemplify that sort of boiling point, like eventually we turn on ourselves eventually without proper care and feeding. We turn on one another. And um, and, and I think this movie sort of exemplifies that. Right. These this parent and child who have no one else but each other right they turn out they turn off everyone by, else whether it's their friends by, yeah. from work by choice by, by choice. choice right they turn off everyone else ex externally and now all they have is one another and they turn on them on on each other too right eventually they they just they 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 boil over and um and so well, i i think i'd say mom boils over i wouldn't i wouldn't say he turns on her yeah i i think that's i think that's probably fair I'll, 
he's he's protecting himself right I, well he's, and, he's, he's said, and he protective. says he's protecting her too yeah, right i mean right. that's his whole uh, it's and to that end it's very interesting how that does connect to goodnight mommy exactly. because these are these kids in this place that that think that there is a monster in their presence and they are doing what they can to to fight against this monster to get their their mom back yes and here she really isn't by the by the end it feels like she's really not his mommy anymore and uh um you know he's i i think trying to get her back into her into herself right she's been basically the babadook i mean it, the way it's depicted on screen the babadook goes into her and kind yeah. of possesses her and uh, that's you know she kills the dog and she yeah. goes after it and he stabs her like all of this sort of stuff and and you know shoots her with the his little arrow gun and sh- or his crossbow i guess so and shoots crafty her, h- as a hits her with like the the ball the catapult that he's created like all these things that he does before he finally kind of gets her to a place where she does uh, exercise this demon from out of her by like vomiting up this blackness and and that's that is really the point where i guess in her mental state you know she's able to kind of come back to her senses and realize what's happening and is fighting against this um this grief that is overtaking her and causing her to uh to enact violence upon yeah. her yeah. son so all of that it, while it feels heavy handed that's just really a small complaint that i have of this movie that otherwise i enjoy the experience i think it's it's shot beautifully i think it is like it's such amazing use of frame right of negative space in this really largely constrained to this sort of single location the house we do go with her to work we see a little bit about what she does and the fact that she's a caretaker at work um you know for for people in need for the elderly and and infirm and then we get a little bit of an experience outside her house uh but largely this takes place in the house and i I think it is a it's just beautifully presented and like you said, the character design of the Babadook, I think, is fantastic. And and the fact that it was all shot very practically, right? There, we yeah. don't have them reacting to, you know, CG monsters. We get uh, a, a real commitment on the part of the filmmaking to a real, tangible, uh, you know, shape of this monster at the end that we even never really see in its entirety. Like in that regard, this is the perfect monster movie because we see it as depicted in the book, but at the end, we never get to see it. We see its wings, we see its kind of hat, and then it falls and it's not itself anymore. It's, it is, um, we get a really obscured reveal. And I like that too. Um, There's just, I I think there's a lot to like about it, even if, if, as the, the story is heavy handed. Yeah, we see like the face the, in yep. the shadows in the closet. We see the shape, the 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 shape of it hanging behind the police officer. Uh, it pops up throughout, and I do really appreciate the way that she did that. Or on the ceiling, stuff like that, where mm-hmm. you know Kent was using some old older film school techniques to kind of to allow for its movement to kind of have that that creepy feel to it that that works really well. And she had referenced lon cheney in in that uh lost film of his london after midnight where he's kind of got those big eyes and that big mouth full of fangs uh with the big top hat and his hands and you know it was kind of a vampire movie that um she referenced that as kind of a look and i think if you look at at old stills of that you'll really see that in in the the shape of the babadook and and how she had kind of created this i i think the the movie also peppers us with symbols that i think we that i i know i didn't catch i i nearly enough of them i'm sure because i think this is the thing that jennifer kent really likes to do um but some of them felt like they weren't necessarily tied into the narrative itself uh and uh, so when she's chewing on glass in the soup where did that come from Don't eat it. The Babadook did it, Mom. 
Go and watch a DVD and I'll make something else. The Babadook did it! Just go and watch a DVD, Samuel. That was something I was very unsure about. Like, because Samuel seems kind of guilty. Did he put something in her soup to kind of like, was he testing her in some way? Uh, did, did, I we, miss did she scoops around his soup? Did she not find any glass in his soup or was it just in hers? I, I don't recall if she found any more or not. But I was trying to remember, like, was this the same day that he had smashed his cannonball or his um, catapult through the window through the through the window and did glass end up in the soup and i just i wasn't paying attention like i i I missed exactly what had happened there or is that just something that she's imagining and he's reacting because she's acting weird about the soup like i I wasn't really sure exactly what happened and later she pulls something out of her mouth and i'm like was this glass that was like stuck in her gum was it a rotting tooth well that was a that to me was a tooth because there were a number of times like when she's in the car driving around right before the accident she's like you know massaging her cheek um you know which indicated to me that she was having jaw pain and then once once the babadook was in her she was able to muster the strength to yank her own tooth but again like I, i wasn't sure what what the message was there right like, was was that a reference to the pain like I, i'm not exactly sure what was happening with all of that well and so that's what i mean by the the symbols like you you start looking at glass and broken glass in particular usually it's a sign of either a broken heart or transformation right spiritually it's it's generally a symbol of of rebirth uh of of coming through trauma and i thought okay well now we're now it's literally a symbol that that defines the experience of the movie. So it's another one of those examples of, um, you know, here we are telling me what the movie is about in, in these symbols quite, you know, it could be taken sort of quite literally. And again, heavy handed, uh, in the, if you're just watching it as a spooky monster movie, glass and soup is a creepy image. And that's, uh, that's great. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, I think it's it's a disservice to the movie because it wasn't directly connected enough to the story. It's not like that's what the like we have any indication that that's what the Babadook does, right? Is is trying to to plant glass in food to make you hurt yourself, right? And same thing with the bugs behind the fridge. Oh, what were the bugs all about? Yeah, because uh, is that just like um, her mind? Like I, I feel like all of it is like kind of the deterioration of her mental state is yeah. really what we're in. Like we're in, in this shell of her brain as things are falling apart. Well, they're falling apart, but didn't she, I mean, she pulls the, the refrigerator out and pulls the wallpaper off and then there's the big hole. And yeah. then the, the officers come in or the, the agents and the hole is patched, right? There is no more. It's not hole. even patched. It's yeah. It's, it's just wood. There, there was no hole. And she said, Oh, not a hole. It was a tear in the wallpaper. They're coming from behind the wallpaper. Yeah. Which trying, is... trying to sell it. But yeah. So I, that I don't know. indicates to me what you were saying that it's in her mind, but the glass seemed real enough and the tooth seemed real enough. And, but see, that's the thing. Cause the Babadook seems real enough. But right. again, the whole idea is that none of this is real. Like we're just watching this metaphor and really, that's all it is. And that's and that's, I suppose, where, you know, it's an it's an interesting film because it's not ever set in the real world. It is just a metaphorical story about a creature that happens to be a depiction of her grief. And so all of these elements are just other elements of, you know, her grief, her broken, you know, as you said, what was the glass like her broken heart, things mm-hmm. like that. And the bugs were probably I don't know what the the symbology of bugs would be, but something like, you know, there is uh, an infestation, like eating away at her from the inside type of thing. I, I have this real anxiety around like the things I hand down to my children. The, and, and I don't mean like, you know, photos and albums. I, I mean, like, you know, my own anxieties. Like, I don't want to be a role model for my kids of things that the stuff that I've been dragging around. And I know to some extent that's impossible. This movie in that regard really is the the dis- depiction of my anxiety around this, because at the end, when the the kid looks to her after she feeds the worms to the monster, the kid looks to her and says, can I ever see it? And she says, maybe one day when you're older. 
Well, of course, you're going to see it when you're older, kid, because we all have it. And I'm going to be giving it to you as as my great, you know, inheritance, which is <laughs> my my grief that you'll also have to live with. Um, I, I think that was a terrific punchline to this movie. Right. That that this is that exploration. I thought that was that was awesome. I think that all of this is why, you know, for some people they really can connect with the film and they really they enjoy this intense ride for for what it is this depiction of grief as a nightmare creature that you have to f- learn to deal with and some people say oh my god this is so heavy-handed it's like yes i get it i get it i i get your point and it's an interesting way to tell a story that does kind of split the audience very much so and and I think that's very interesting because I can certainly see it both ways. You know, um, I think for me, I, I, I side with the version where I'm like, you know, it's, it's, I haven't seen it told quite so, um, on its sleeve before. And I kind of enjoy how they're using it to you know, like how Kent and her team are allowing the story to unfold in that way. So I, I kind of like it, you know, I, I guess that heavy handedness, it doesn't end up bugging me and I don't have as much of an issue with it. I think it would bug me a lot more if I didn't like how the film was constructed. Right. I I have such a good time, like in the in the camera and and just looking at the, the transitions. Right. When she transitions from waking to sleep. Right. When you know she's she has that experience where she's up and then suddenly the camera moves all funny and the light changes and and what well, goes into what bang. feels like a time lapse, right? Yeah, it, yeah, I mean, yeah. It feels it's like really suddenly we're time lapse over like you know, over you know five to ten seconds over yeah. like ten hours. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And it goes so fast, and suddenly we're there. Or when she falls into her bed, the first one, you know, she's kind of falling, and the bed comes up to meet her. I thought those those little tricks and tropes were so entertaining just visually like they were candy so uh there's there's a lot to like about i think the the visual experience of the film and that speaks exactly to that whole idea of we're living inside this woman's head who is i mean she she is exhausted right i mean she yeah. just can't uh, like her sense of time her sense of space it's all kind of mushed together because she has no like she's not getting any sleep and so yeah when you see those things that's probably how it feels to her like she lays down to sleep and she feels restless for about 10 seconds and then suddenly her son's jumping on her saying mommy it's nine o'clock it's like what the hell just yeah. happened and and i thought that was a really fascinating way to kind of depict those things and put us into her head completely completely if there i mean again to that experience of the relationship of her you know frustration and rage with her son her frustration and rage with not being able to sleep i absolutely relate to that i mean that is that is right over home plate for me I, it's just she it was perfectly depicted here which i mean fits into a story where we're in her head dealing yep. with her grief her battle with her own her own grief. So I, I think that this is a film where uh, film as metaphor ends up allowing all of those things to really, uh, really work in context of this yeah. story as it's yeah. being told. And to that end, weirdly, it feels very much like a Stephen King sort of thing. Like, I feel like, and that's something I find really interesting with the Babadook as a creature, as I've been kind of re-exploring so many Stephen King stories as of late, I find that he really enjoys those things. Like, these creatures that are kind of a metaphorical depiction of something that the characters in the story are are dealing with. And so I feel like there's a real element of that within his work. And so I I like that the way that hers feels right at home with those. Yeah, I'm actually rereading The Shining right now, and I'd forgotten just how much of that parent-child relationship and the struggles and the broken arm, Danny's broken arm, and the like. all of those things are very much at play in in that book. That is a great comparison I had not made. Uh, Very, very kingdom. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, all right. Uh, You want to talk a little bit about any performances that uh, really uh, light you up what do you think of, about the the kid and his ability on screen i mean i know you i know you have your annoyances with 
the parent child relationship, but the kid. The, well, the, I struggle with both of them, but I think, and this is my battle with the film because I think I'm intended to struggle with both of them, and and so I just have to get over my own issue and say, you know what, I have to, I have to find, uh, and now I'm going to forget which one is which, sympathy or empathy. I have to empathize with these characters. I can't sympathize because I haven't gone through it, but I can empathize with them even though I may disagree with choices, right? Sure. And so to that end, I mean, I think Essie Davis as Amelia and Noah Wiseman as Samuel are giving really strong performances here. Like, I never doubt for a second anything they're going through. I think they both play it incredibly well, and I really enjoy it. And I do think, you know, I, I don't know, part of me sometimes struggles with Samuel because he is so obnoxious and because it's like he's he so clearly is a problem child. But then I'm like, but that's not the actor. That's not, you know, that's there's nothing wrong with that. That's how Jennifer Kent wrote the character of Samuel as a kid who has had seven years living with mom as she has slowly been kind of descending to a place where she's just not able to actually provide any parenting at all. And he's largely on his own, making his own weapons, teaching himself magic from videos. Or talking, saying too much to other kids about uh, the state of things. And so I, I can't fault him for any of that, because I think that's just part of the character of Samuel. And so to that end, it's really interesting because, you know, Danny Pintaro, he was six when he uh, was in Cujo, and I thought he was fantastic in that film. Noah Wiseman also was six, and 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 Jennifer Kent had talked about how she actually had auditioned a lot of older kids to play, but she said that they just, they read older. They, they were hard. They didn't, they felt like they were too mature to be really going along with any of this sort of stuff. And so that's when they started looking at younger kids. And that's when she clicked with uh, Noah Wiseman. And I, I buy it with him as, as much as sometimes I can struggle just the, with the character, because I, I, I find the character a lot of work. But I think Noah Wiseman is doing a great job in the role. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have already said it. I don't have as much of a problem with the obnoxious part because it feels so real to me. Like, it feels like such a lived-in experience. Well, that's why I have a problem with it, because it feels so real. And I'm like, I cannot that's deal what with it this feels. Kid. I was just going to say, this makes you sound old. <laughs> it makes me <laughs> a little right. bit I'm a grumpy old man. Yeah. <laughs> Take you kid home. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, so I, I really, I feel like I can relate to this experience, and and it just feels like it, there's nothing sort of joyous uh, uh, about their experience living together until I guess the end, when you know she's finally able to to realize that she's she's got to she has to make room for her life. In for all of these elements of, of her life together, including her child, and uh, and and so it, it to me, I think their performances on screen were fascinating and uh, terrifying, and I, I think you know really lend a lot to the metaphorical part of of the movie. I think they did a fantastic job. I was really surprised that the kid, frankly, was able to pull that kind of frenetic energy and uh, consistency in this movie and um i i feel like he's he's a great child actor like he did a great job being obnoxious like that that's a role but to your point that's that's the role he was hired to play uh and and i think he did it i think what they had to do to get his reactions and to not put him in a place that would cause him actual trauma by just making this movie is is equally fascinating. And I and and the care that it sounds like Jennifer Kent went through to to make sure that he was able to give you know reaction shots to mom screaming at him those horrible things, saying those horrible things to him uh, while not being her scene partner saying things that would scare him relatively uh, while, uh, you know, still being able to to bring him to the level that matches hers, I think is, right. is really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I like that Kent thought about that. I mean, she said, I didn't want to destroy a childhood to make this film. And I think that's important, which I don't know how often you hear directors who have children in horror movies, like really taking that into account as they go through the motions with that, you know, like you hear the horror stories of like monster squad, for example, when 
they did it like there was the girl who was genuinely scared of the vampire character and they purposefully didn't let her see the vampire character until the moment when he turned around and picked her up so that they could get an authentic reaction from her. And I'm like, that may not be the best approach to actually directing yeah. a scene like that. I mean, I get it. You got genuine fear out of that child when she saw the vampire character pick her up. But at the same time, it's like, this is a kid, and you have to take that into account, I think, as a director when you're making a film so that you're not leading to trauma in a in a young person, right? And so yeah. I, I think that's a very critical thing. And so, yeah, so she had... In those scenes, she they would be yelling stuff at, at Noah, like, I'm going to take your Legos and throw them in the river to get the reactions that they needed out of him. Yeah. As opposed to hearing the sorts of abuse that she was hurling at him <laughs> later in the film. But she said she was going to go do like a mafia thing. She was going to put him in cement first and then throw him at the river. Yeah, <laughs> just, just awful to do to Legos first. <laughs> I get why he was wound up about that. Yeah. But I mean, you see a kid who's like the way that he like is is having a major fit in the backseat of the car, having convulsions like there are some moments in this film that he's doing stuff. And I'm like, he is like, really I mean, good. It's, it's it's a strong performance. And, you know, and I get it. It's it's it can be a challenge to go along with that, especially if you're not somebody who is used to dealing with kids. But, um, yeah, it's a, there's a lot to that performance. Yeah, truly. You want to talk a little bit about Jennifer Kent's start? Well, I find it so interesting because she actually went to, I, I think, uh, started as an actor going through school with Essie Davis. They actually went to school together. And then she kind of lost interest in acting. She kind of, it petered out, it didn't have that interest. And she was more interested in the filmmaking side. She actually wrote a letter to Lars von Trier and asked if she could assist him on the production of Dogville. This was in the early aughts interestingly accepted i'm like why didn't i ever think about that when i was in film school can i can i be your assistant on this movie so she went and worked on it and she said it was basically her film school and the she said the her key lesson that she took away from it is learning how to be stubborn which i found really interesting and and i mean because yeah you want to be able to stick with your guns and so that really is is how she kind of got her start in telling these stories and everything. And and she had, for this particular script, I think she went through a number of different drafts of it, trying to figure out the tone and the feel and everything. And she was citing a lot of horror movies from the 60s, 70s, and 80s as the influence for this particular film. but And then a lot of it came from, she had a friend. She said, I have a friend who's a single mother whose son was traumatized by this monster figure that he thought he saw everywhere in the house. So I thought, what if this thing was real on some level? So I made Monster, that's her short film, about that idea. But I couldn't leave it alone. I kept coming back to it. And that led to The Babadook. I really enjoyed Monster. And I think that it is so efficient in the way it gets to the point that I mean, I found it just such a, a wonderful little bite sized nugget of filmmaking. In some respects, it just it sort of gets over all of the heavy handed metaphor part that I struggle with for just like we're just living in this world and it's super literal and mom's a badass. Yeah, mom's a badass and she she puts the monster in its corner. And then takes care of it and says, yeah. look, I'll still, I'll still give you some milk when you need yeah. it. But it's interesting how much of the Babadook came from that monster, like the long skinny fingers and I stuff. Know. Like, it's like she really had this, this creature in her mind, which I find really interesting. Yeah, yeah truly. Um, okay. So do you want to, you want to dive into the rainbow, the Baba rainbow? A few years after the film came out, I think this started on, on Tumblr. There was somebody who said, whenever whenever someone says the Babadook isn't openly gay, it's like, did you even watch the movie? And it it really kind of turned into this whole conversation between all sorts of people on Twitter, on Instagram, and all this stuff. And uh, it, it became this idea of the Babadook represents kind of the LGBT community. This, this person, Lanstagram, said, a movie about a gay man who just wants to live his life in a small Australian suburb. It may not be just a movie to you, but to the LGBT community, the Babadook is a symbol of our journey. And that really turned into this whole idea of this of this <laughs> kind of this character that became a meme and a, uh, you know, a, a character that represents um, homosexuality and queerness. And I find that so interesting. Now, there's also a kind of a whole thing of people kind of at this point saying, you know what, it's kind of 
it's run its course. It's it's hit a point where everybody knows about it, and so now it's like uh, it may not pop up nearly as popular anymore. But it was a thing for a, a good while, and and may still be. But I find that to be a really interesting thing that I ne- I knew nothing about until. I started reading about it and I found this this article on Vox called How the Babadook Became the LGBTQ Icon We Didn't Know We Needed. <laughs> I, so. I think I need to know more about about the characteristics of the Babadook that make him the LGBT icon. Because I, I usually find myself, I, I like to think of myself as a pretty like sensate guy when it comes to these things. And I'm able to relate. And this I I'm I can't yet. Is it that I've heard I've read some of the reviews, some of the letterbox reviews was the the gay man in a top hat kind of a thing. But the top hat is not it's not an overtly gay symbol. The whole idea of it was that um, and and I think it just became something that people were sharing and it became just, I don't know, a lot of fun in conversation. But there were people who were trying to look more into it. Um, There was uh, somebody who was trying to. Um, figure it out. There was a, a, a meme that was posted where, it, you know, somebody tweeted, Babadook, I'm a terrifying monster that destroys families that try to suppress me. Gay people. Oh, my God. Same. Drinks later. And so it became this idea of this is this this is this idea of this dark, scary creature that is going to destroy you. But really, it's not, you know, oh, duh, of course, yeah. I I was looking at it as the monster, like the character itself. But no, it's, no, no, it's no. Yet it's... another example, another vessel of representation. I get it. OK, another metaphor. Yeah. Right. No, you you helped me. Look at what yeah. you did. There you, you go. You helped me that's, cross the bridge, Andy. Thank you. That's what I'm that's what I'm here for. Wow. So, yeah. So uh, it's, uh, you know, and here's another one. It's. Uh, The Babadook's queer legacy and our infatuation with it borrows on all these ideas. The desire to go with and improve upon the joke, the increased earnestness around that joke, and the resulting amplification of the absurdity of a homosexual Babadook living a life of queer defiance by terrorizing a white Australian family. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's funny. That's funny. uh, Yeah, so um, I, I, you know, and it's funny because like I don't. I, I would never have seen that if, if it weren't for, you know, articles on the Internet that kind of talk about this sort of thing. So I find that really interesting And in that I haven't seen Jennifer Kent comment at all about that. But I find the way that people are able to find these interpretations, um, I, I find it makes the story more rich and the exploration of the films uh, that much more exciting. All right. Well, enough of this. Um, we will be right back. But first, our credits. The Next Reel is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Ty Simon, Oriel Novella, and Eli Catlin. Andy usually finds the stats for the awards and numbers at d-numbers.com, boxofficemojo.com, imdb.com, and wikipedia.org. Find the show at truestory.fm. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Okay, so we've already talked about Monster as a prequel. When when do we get to see, you know, what happens to the Baba Duke in the Baba Deuce? <laughs> Baba Deuce. Uh, <laughs> that probably has an image that you don't yeah, need to. Probably, but I've uh, been working on that joke all night. So Baba, Baba Deuce Bigelow. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole other career out there for the Babadook. Jennifer Kent actually holds the rights to this film, and she has been asked about sequels, and she says, I will never allow any sequel to be made because it's not that kind of film. I don't care how much I'm offered. It's just not going to happen. Wow. She puts a pretty fine point on it. I wonder if that's true. That makes me think. It makes me want to come up with a number. (laughs) Like, everybody's got a price, right? Uh, well, I guess you'd have to get that much to find out. <laughs> okay. Well, everybody's got to have dreams. That's right. How to do it award season.
Uh, really well. This film, you know, definitely struck a chord. 56 wins, 64 other nominations. Over at the Saturn Awards, one of our favorites, the uh, Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror. This film was nominated for Best Horror, but lost to Dracula Untold, which uh, surprises me because I don't remember hearing good things about it, but maybe I need to see that one now. Um, S.E. Davis was nominated for Best Actress, but lost to Rossman Pike in Gone Girl, which I don't know. I guess are they putting that in horror? As far as why it was nominated, not quite sure there. And best performance by a younger actor for Noah, but he lost to Maisie Williams for Game of Thrones. Again, interesting, because I, I guess in that category, they don't split across film Movies versus television. TV, yeah. Yeah. At Fantastic Fest, this film won all the awards it was nominated for in the horror features category. That was best actor, best actress, best picture, and best screenplay. And at, the, at Australia's Academy Awards, the AACTAs, it was. It received the Byron Kennedy Award, and it won Best Film. It tied with uh, Russell Crowe's The Water Diviner, which he was directing that one. And Jennifer Kent won Best Direction, Best Screenplay. It was nominated for Best Editing, Best Production Design, and Best Lead Actress for uh, Davis. But in all those cases, lost to Predestination in Absolutely. the case of actress Sarah Snook. Yeah. Absolutely okay with that. I like the production design. If it were like if there were a creature design award, then certainly. But overall production design, I think predestination. Sure. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Agreed. How to do the box office? Kent had a total of two million dollars to make her movie. Uh, yeah, I'll point out everywhere online that's listed in U.S. dollars, not Australian. Um, I I think the Australian budget originally was two and a half million plus. They did end up raising 30000 more through Kickstarter just to build the sets. So I assume this has all been rounded, and what we're left with is approximately $2 million in U.S. dollars. That puts the film at a total budget of $2.16 million in today's dollars. The film premiered in Sundance in 2014, then opened in Australia May 24th, 2014. It played at a lot of other festivals, then opened November 28th, 2014 in theaters and digitally in the U.S., opposite The Imitation Game and Wild. Perhaps because it was released day and date on streaming platforms, this film didn't do that much business in the U.S., only earning 964000 domestically. Internationally, it earned almost $9.35 million, and I'm assuming that a lot of that was probably the Australian box office. All told, it earned $11.1 million in today's dollars, so, you know, it still ended up with an adjusted profit per finished minute of $95,500. Well, that's something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's something. I, uh... I- I, I don't I don't fault it that I didn't hate the movie. I think there's a lot to, to really like about it. I stand by my first surprise. I am surprised that this movie is so loved by so many when I just couldn't connect with it quite so deeply. Um, but I think there's a lot. There's certainly a lot to talk about and uh, a lot of solid filmmaking to be admired. And just as an interesting side note, they actually released the, you could actually buy copies of the actual Mr. Babadook children's book. They made like gorgeous, gorgeous copies. They had extra pages and everything. And they were selling them. It was a pop-up book too, right? It, like it was, it a was the full yeah. pop-up book. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And they, they ended up doing a few runs of it. The first run, because they were selling them for between 80 and $100 uh, per book. And uh, they sold thousands of them. So, I mean, they made, when I calculated it out, it was like seven seven hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that, just on the first run of pop up books. Wow. So I don't know what their production costs were, but obviously they found a strong niche in something else, uh, another way to kind of make a little extra money on the side. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, we'll be right back. We're going to talk about our ratings and reviews, but first, here's the trailer for next week's movie, The Lure. Have you watched The Lure? We want to know what you thought. This one seems to uh, divide people, so we're really curious. Send us your thoughts in a 30-second audio clip, and we just might get it in the episode. Send it to reviews at truestory.fm. Oh, I'm Po świecie są dzieci mojej dobrej znajomej. 
Będą robiły u nas chórki i striptizy. Musicie się tylko dobrze bawić, reszta pójdzie sama. Dobry wieczór bardzo szanownemu państwu. Przed państwem córki dancingu. Dwóch szerenek. Chciałam pokazać się z najlepszej strony. Zmienić coś, zmienić. Zwrócić uwagę, zwróciłam wszystko. Szum, szum, szum samochodów. Okay, Andy, where do you land in Letterboxd? How do you how do you possibly put stars and hearts against the Babadook? My initial review of this was two stars, no heart. Um, I I'm glad I rewatched it. I actually found more to connect with in the film this time. I still don't think that I loved it. I I think I'm probably at three stars and a heart with it. Um, but you know, I I, I think that that's uh, definitely a sign that. I'm finding more with it, and it certainly is an interesting movie worth uh, watching and talking about. I was actually wondering if you were going to land at the three star. I I definitely started at the three star. And my question was whether or not I was going to go to three and a half. I, I didn't yeah. have a lot, a huge window there, um, and I, I think I'm fine at three. Honestly, like I feel like we got we got what we needed to get out of talking about the movie. Uh, it's a solid and competently made film uh, by a strong filmmaker with a, a terrific eye. And I, but I will give it the heart. I will give it the heart because, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed watching and talking about this movie with my son. That was it yeah. was worth it. It sounds like you had a better conversation with your son than I had with my daughter. Her reaction was, huh? OK. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of <laughs> end of that discussion. And well, and I should say during the movie, like he would lean over to me and and say, OK. My heart is pounding. What is going on right now? <laughs> Not quite like Nightmare on Elm Street, like 19, is it? Uh, like, there are some pieces that are that are, are damn thrilling in, in this movie. The use of light and shadow. It's it It's got some good scares. Yeah, yeah. So what did you think about The Babadook? We want to know. Hop into the Show Talk channel in our Discord community, and we're going to be talking about it this week. When the movie ends. Our conversation begins. Letterboxd, give it, Andrew. As Letterboxd always do it. You're sort of insufferable about Letterboxd today, so you should probably go first. <laughs> I have a four-star uh, on Letterboxd, written by Simon Ramshaw, uh, who saw this, uh, you know, the year it came out, 2014, and had this to say about the film. Ba, ba, duke, duke, duke. Push my apple, shake the tree. Ba, ba, duke, 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 scare the shit out of me. <laughs> There you go. Wow. That's right. That's I don't right. even I don't I don't actually right. want to follow that. Um <laughs> hey. How can I, you I just said it, How can you I never, you know, with, with Letterbox we we always go either popular or you know, most activity, right? Or five star or one star. Um I decided to go with a new metric, which was the first review ever captured on Letterbox because I think it really speaks to the tone and tenor of the quality of the community that Letterboxd has always been trying to achieve. Do you know what I mean? The oh. high class, high quality review and insightful thinking about cinema that Letterboxd celebrates. And so I give you a four star review by Maya Ullerin, who says, Beautiful, but scary as shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was there review number one, really setting there the bar, is. setting the bar <laughs> right here. Mm. Eh, thanks, Letterboxd. You're doing, you're doing great. I'm going to throw this review in here, too. You are? This is by, this is by Matthew Buchanan, Mr. Letterboxd himself. We Who should only review Matthew we Buchanan. Should only, <laughs> There's just right. new a rule. New rule. If <laughs> Matt Buchanan has reviewed a movie that we talk about, 
We have to talk about it on the show. We're, we're One of us it. has to pick the Matt Buchanan. That's right. Uh, Matthew Buchanan gave it two stars, starts out well, bearing a little black Aussie humor and employing the kind of abrupt cuts between scenes that push the narrative along briskly, while also conveying that something's a little off kilter. Essie Davis and Noah Wiseman are perfect as sparring widow and son. But as the tension builds and the central premise is revealed, there isn't enough in the mechanics of the story to justify where it ventures thematically. And the ending feels hackneyed and expected. Plus, not actually very scary. Dang, why did we do a whole podcast about it? <laughs> when there was that when there thanks was that. letterbox matthew buchanan andy it's hard to believe we've been having weekly conversations about movies since 2011 oh you're telling me producing this show week after week is so much fun but it does require a ton of work behind the scenes if you'd like to help support our efforts one easy way is by using our originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals has links to purchase the source material behind our adapted film discussions. Your purchases there help support the show at no extra cost. For the entirety of season 11, we featured films directed by women. The only exceptions were some of our member bonus episodes. We talked about the lure for our horror debuts series, which is a very loose adaptation of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Definitely miles from the Disney versions. <laughs> For our 10-year anniversary series, we covered We Need to Talk About Kevin, taken from the Lionel Shriver novel. Man, that was brilliant. And horrifying. Yeah. The Journalist series included Merrily We Go to Hell and The Weight of Water, adapted from Anita Shreve's bestseller. We filled some gaps in previous series with member bonus episodes on adaptations like Malcolm X, Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House, Cactus Flower, Wild at Heart, Life Force, and the Blues Brothers. Our John Hurd series looked at a trio of adaptations, Chilly Scenes of Winter from the novel by Ann Beatty, Awakenings based on Oliver Sacks' nonfiction book, and Rambling Rose adapted from the Calder Willingham novel. Two films in our coming-of-age debut series were adapted from books, The Virgin Suicides from Jeffrey Eugenides and The Diary of a Teenage Girl, Phoebe Gluckner's graphic novel. We had Queen of Katwe for our sports series based on Tim Crothers' nonfiction book. And Clueless kicked off our 90s comedy series, loosely adapted from Jane Austen's Emma. It totally took place in the 90s, though. <laughs> Find all of these books and more adaptations on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read from the movies we've covered. Visit thenextreel.com slash originals today. 